Okay, um, so welcome everyone to this uh, presentation and um, say my name is David Long and over the next 60 minutes I'm going to attempt to try to give you a bit of an insight to get you started with distant variables and UVM. Now, just a word of warning, this isn't going to be anything like a normal training course. And so, given the invitation, distant variables, we normally spend five days at intensive um, training to get people up to speed with distant error loss, including lots of time with hands-on exercises. And then we normally recommend they spend another sort of a few weeks um, playing with that before attending the UVM course, which is another uh, four days intensive training. So don't expect at the end of this that you'll actually be able to go away and start immediately working on distant error or UVM. It's far too complex for that. But to get you started, first of all, in the uh, um, notes, I've tried to give you a whole set of examples that you can try out for yourself. And when you're doing that, um, I also mention a GeoLoss environment uh, EDA playground. So there's a link on the GeoLoss website to another external website called EDA playground, which we manage. And on that um, EDA playground, you can get access to the full set of commercial EDA tools. So tools from Cadence, from Synopsys, from um, Mentor Graphics, who are now known as um, Demon BDA, or um, even uh, Alder. Okay, so the simulators that work for System Verilog and UVM are available on that site for anyone to use. And there's links um, in a couple of slides to examples where you can play with them yourself. So you'll need to, you'll need to do some extra work after, after this to get up to speed. Additionally, Give an indication of the scale of System Verilog. Um, our System Verilog Golden Reference Guide, so we write these for people that attend our courses, so they've got something to refer to when they're actually uh, writing code themselves. So what you find is an alphabetical guide to all the main language features together with hints and tips and examples. Uh, and again, links to eBay Playground where you can try out some of those examples. Um, if you go and see Sandra, who's still at the back here on our stand after this session, then um, she'll, she's looking forward to giving you each a copy of each one of these. So that will hopefully be useful in your future um, as well. Okay, now, before we get started, um, just a, as an indication, how many of you have actually looked at System Verilog or UVM before? Can just show of hands, anybody? So that's most of you. Anybody actually written a test bench in System Verilog? A couple of you, yeah, kind of. What about UVM? Has, has anyone run UVM? Again, not too many. That's fine. Um, I wasn't making any assumptions. So uh, we're starting off assuming that hopefully you've met um, hardware description languages at some point in the past, and then we'll dive, dive in from there. Okay, so let's see. So we we'll start off by having a look at System Verilog. Uh, just to remind you what it is in case you haven't come across it before, uh, looking at in particular System Verilog classes, because that's Really, really what we're going to be looking at in UVM. Use of interfaces, so how do we connect our class-based system Verilog environment through to the RTL code that is then synthesized, and a bit about constraints. So what is system Verilog? Well, it's a little bit different from some of the other hardware description languages like VHDL and Verilog, which are also out there and preceded it, because it was designed right from the start to be both a hardware design and verification language. Okay, so that's not really true for VHDL or Verilog, they had slightly different origins. It first came about publicly in 2005 when it was, became an IEEE standard. That's actually the same year as the very last Verilog standard was released. And System Verilog is actually a superset of Verilog. Now, when you release new language, there's often lots of uh, inconsistencies and uh, things that don't quite work in it. So there were some major changes in the next release in 2009. Also in 2009, Verilog ceased it to exist as a separate uh, language reference framework. Effectively, it's now a particular subset of system There have been a few minor changes since then, so in 2012, 2017, um, there's likely to be another sort of update um, in the next um, year or so. We can break system Verilog down into several different categories. So we can talk about the RTL constructs, 
the system drawer assertions, um, SVAs as often referred to, and the test bench. And those are quite different language constructs. Okay, so you might have heard this morning um, that system drawer log was described as being a sort of a very sort of a odd language. It seems to have lots of different bits in it. Uh, one of my colleagues used to refer to it as a dog's breakfast because it's basically lots of bits of other languages bundled together into uh, one language and they don't always fit that well together. Here I'm showing some of the main features from the different um, categories. So for RTL, we've got constructs that make System Verilog a more efficient RTL language than plain Verilog. So things like extra type data types, you can see, um, ways of being able to uh, uh, describe more concisely what a process is doing, for example. So rather than saying always at positive clock, you could say always FF if it's a flip flop. So little things like that. Packages, just like BHDL for reusability, interfaces for bundling together um, connections. The assertions are not like anything else in System Verilog, so they really are something separate, um, but very useful if you want to write properties about a design. So as verification engineers, that's what we want to do. And useful for both simulation and also for formal verification. So with formal verification, you can write properties, that's, that's what happens. The tool will then test if those properties are true or false. Whereas in simulation, it's like um, assertions in software where if it's false, it gives you a message. The test bench, there's lots of new features in terms of Verilog. Um, we're going to focus on classes and constrained random stimulus. So that's really what we need for UVM. And there's also enhancements to interfaces for other languages. So the direct programming interface is really nice because it allows you to easily connect together system Verilog and C code. And if you can connect together C code, you can also connect together um, C++. Although you can't access any of the features that are not part of C. So you can't, for example, call a C++ class from inside your um, system Verilog. So another way of looking at it, we've got items in system Verilog that make it a better Verilog. Let me describe some of those. And there's items which make it better uh, for verification. So our classes, constraints, coverage, um, allows you to create um, built-in types of yourself, and it also enhance built-in types of things like strings. And a virtual interface, that allows you to connect to an actual interface in, in Verilog. And then in the middle, there's all this stuff that came in from other languages, which is not really very useful, it's just some noise. So I'm not going to talk about that. Right? Example might be something like the program construct, which used to be a mechanism in the Vera language, and that's how you created classes in Vera. So it's still part of system Verilog, but it's something you don't need to, need to use or know. Okay, so we're going to focus on classes because that's what's required for UVM. So here's an example showing a system Verilog class if you're not familiar with the um, syntax. So here's the start keyword class, give it a name, and in the class, just like in C, we can have data members and member functions. Now that's actually really useful in a verification environment because it gives you a way of grouping together the uh, data values which are required for some particular uh, operation, such as a bus transaction, together with the functions that are going to process that. Now, if you can contrast that with what you'd have in other languages like VHD or Verilog, you don't have that ability to group those things together. So you end up with uh, a large set of global functions and it becomes difficult to manage as you want to introduce new types. But with classes, it gives you a way of uh, packaging everything up together. Okay, so that's used extensively in system in UVM. Notice that classes are data types. And so we have to create objects that are going to be of that data type, just like you would do in software. And because it's a data type, we can put it in a package. So a package is a feature added in System Verilog, which is similar to a VHDL package. It gives you a way of being able to reuse code uh, from one project to another project or across a project. And so we can import packages, and that makes 
um, code and test for it in a controlled fashion without worrying about um, name collisions and things like that. Okay, so as we said, always put classes in it. So how do we create an object then? Well, here we start showing a module. So we still have modules in System Verilog, just like we had in Verilog. And in our module, we've got an initial block which is going to run at the start of simulation. So that's where we can create our object. So unlike modules, which are created statically when you start your simulation, so it's an elaboration process, with the uh, classes, they are created dynamically at that time. Okay, so there's a difference in the way that they are actually uh, created. So what we need to use for is, is we create a handle. So bus trans was our class. So T1 and T2 are handles to objects, which are going to be a type bus trans. So it's like a pointer in C. And when you create that um, T1 and T2, initially they're going to have the value null. And if you try using them as the, in that state, then you're going to go one time error. So to create an object, the <coughs> function u is possible. Okay, so that creates our new object. So here's our bus transaction. We've got some uh, values for the various members. And we can then use the dot operator to access those members. So it's a very similar to the way that we do things in other languages like C++ and Java. Okay. Now, because T1 and T2 are handles, if we assign T1 to T2, it doesn't actually create a new object. It just means that T1 and T2 are both pointing to the same object. So if we do something to T2.data, it actually changes the value of data it has for in the um, one of these things. So print, uh, here we're calling the function print to T1, and it doesn't print the value x1234. Instead, we get ABCD because that's the last thing we've written. Okay, so it's very easy using objects. Now, if we're doing this in, say, C++, and we call new to create a new object, you have to remember to call delete, otherwise you get memory leakage. You don't need to worry about that in System Verilog. System Verilog manages the memory for you. So there is what's known as a garbage collector that cleans up behind you. So when our objects are no longer being referenced anywhere, they automatically get cleaned up. Now, if you want to have more control over how objects are created, then rather than just calling new, where you get the default values of the members, we can create our own function view inside the class. Okay, so that's the constructor for the class. And the job of the constructor is to initialize the data members whenever you create a new object. Okay, so inside here, we're setting values for the address for data, calling a function to print out the message and so on. And once you add this function view, it's guaranteed to be called whenever an object of that type is created. Okay, so it's not a requirement. If you don't create it, it's still, your program will still run, but it's there to give you more flexibility, which is what we normally want. It's also possible, just like other functions, to add arguments into function view. So that's useful if you want to have more control over how objects get initialized because you can pass parameters in that will, for uh, uh, example, the direction that can be used to set that thing. Okay, so that gives us flexibility. Now, we can't mix and match, unfortunately. So if we've got um, a call to new and we've now created a function view that takes arguments, you're going to get compiler error because the compiler thinks the function view takes a value. Okay, so you can only um, use the function view with whatever construction you declare. You can't you can't have more than one version. So system Verilog doesn't support function overloading. Okay. You can make things a little bit more flexible by giving a deep class. So that gives you some ability to perhaps not always have the same value or to miss a value out. So if you if you have a default then it's optional. Okay, so that's basically how classes work. Now, there are other interesting things that you can put in a class that can help to make it more usable. And you might have um, heard talk of constrained random 
simul uh, stimulus this morning. Well, how do we get that in system prologue? The answer to that is we can make any of the beta numbers rank. So this rank keyword in front of the beta number means that that data number will automatically get randomized when we call a special randomized function for objects. Okay, so we can put that on any members. Um, here ID isn't a, isn't a rand, we just get it const when we increment it inside the structure. So having got our modified bus train, we create a bus trains object, then that will call the constructor, here function u which increments ID. So initially, ID will be zero, and these other values here um, will be some defaults. But the next thing we're doing, um, after calling new, is calling randomize. So the randomized function is created automatically whenever you've got one or more random numbers in a class. Yeah, and you can call the randomize function, and it will randomize Every member that has one, but only those members. It doesn't touch any of the, any of the other members. So when we call random, uh, randomize, we get random direction and values for the address of data. Going around our loop, we then to reuse TR. So when we call new a second time, that's going to create a new object. TR is now pointing to that new object, which means that the previous object is no longer being referenced. So that will then be a candidate for garbage collection if it's not being used somewhere else. So usually if it in a test bench, what we'd do is we would actually pass on that um, reference to another downstream component before reusing it. Yeah, if we don't do that, it just gets garbage collected automatically. So we get different values now when we randomize it, ID gets increased automatically. So the third time, Again, ID gets incremented, and we get more random values <coughs> for the uh, other the random field. So, using uh, randomized uh, classes like that is really easy. So, it happens automatically. You just have to add the random keyword and call randomize. Okay, so it's easy to set up, and we'll come back to talking more about randomization when we have a look at the VM. Now, creating a test bench for a complex design is itself incredibly complex. In fact, as a general rule, there are normally far more lines of code in the test bench than the device you're testing. Okay, so if your code is that big for the, for the design you're testing, it's probably going to be that big for the test bench. So, it takes time and effort to create a test bench. Typically, you've got limited number of verification engineers, limited time on the project to make sure it's working. So you want to be able to streamline the process as far as possible. So if you can make code reusable, then reuse it on a future project, that's a really good um, thing to aim for. So we can do that by separating out bits of code that are related to a specific version of the device under test. So that's what DUT stands for, if you've seen what that before, the device under test. So things like um, clocks and inputs and output signals of particular types, they're closely related to the particular version of the device under test. So we can put all of that in this module that we call the test harness. Code that is related to the functionality of the test bench, we'll put in another module. So we're calling this here rather grandly a verification environment. And we're doing things like generating the stimulus, and we've got code to check the results. And ideally, these will work at a fairly abstract level, so that if we wanted to reuse the, any of that code on a different version of the design, then we could do so. We might need to change some of the data types down here for different data types, but we wouldn't need to touch the code that we've written. So that allows us to put all this code into a library and we're going to use classes because that's ideally suited to that. We could also do things like inherit classes to modify their behavior, which again gives us more flexibility for all of the test bench code. So I mentioned that classes uh, are used to create objects at runtime. So that's different 
from system dialog modules and also system dialog interfaces, which are statically created. So we have to create modules and interfaces at elaboration time, so that's at time zero before the simulation starts running. And once you've created them, you can't change anything. And so it, it, it's unfixed. With objects, though, they're created by calling new um, when the simulation is running. Now, it may be at time zero still, it may be inside that initial block, but it's actually after the simulation has started running. So they're not static. If we want to control the structure, then we can put parameters on classes in exactly the same way as you can have parameters on modules. We can also use other um, features like constructor arguments. We can create and destroy objects at any time during the simulation. So they're created by calling new, they're destroyed automatically when they're no longer there. But in our environment, we're going to have two very different types of objects. So we want to use classes for creating things like transactions. So those would be created in large numbers during the simulation, and typically they'll get destroyed after use. But we also want to have classes used for the equivalent of components. So rather than building the actual component like the stimulus generator, for example, or a checker out of a module, if we can build them using a class, that gives us more flexibility. But we still want it to behave in a similar way to the modules. So we want to create an instance of our stimulus generator or our checker at, at time zero. And that's going to persist until we get to the end of the simulation. Okay, so components and the um, actual stimulus are both based on classes, but they have different characteristics in terms of their lifetime. Okay, so let's have a look at how we can put it all together. We want to have a top level module that's going to uh, contain our uh, class based environment. So here we've got um, a class TBN, assuming that's in a package, so we're importing the package, and then here creating an instance of our test bench by calling it. And then let's assume that we've got some tasks and functions that are members of the test bench, so we may have a run task that's going to do things like generate the stimulus and check the result. Okay, so we can still have tasks inside a class that can consume time. Okay, so that's, what we, that's how we would advance, but that's actually running inside a system parallel process that's part of that top level module. So you can't put always blocks uh, and initial blocks inside a class. Okay, so they're limited to the static types of components. But we can emulate the behavior of those processes by having tasks inside the class uh, that are called from their parent process. So let's assume we've got another task inside the environment, which is going to drive a pin on the uh, device under test. Okay, so the drive sim is going to take an input, a one or zero, and it's going to wait for positive blockage and then write that to the corresponding pin on the device under test. Okay, so here on the other side, we've got our harness with the low level, behavior, low level components. The device under test is sitting inside there, and we've got the sim on an automatic block. So, how do we make the connection? We've got two modules. Well, having two modules in a system bearer log. Um, uh, simulation isn't a problem, they can both be sitting there as top level modules running in parallel, or you could have some uh, ultimate top level module that instantiates them both. But what about the communication between stuff in this class and the sort of hierarchy here? Well, we could write code like this, it's perfectly legal. So we've got our drive that's using a hierarchical reference to pick up the block inside the harness module. And also to pick up a pin that's part of that harness module. Now that would work, but it's a really bad idea. Remember, I said we wanted to separate the code that runs the test from the actual sort of low-level bits that are blocked to a particular version of the design. Well, we've just broken it by having to hardwire in parts. So if we change a different version of the uh, device under test, 
these parts may not be may not be legal anymore. Okay, so we've got to unpick everything and then put it back together. We want to avoid that. So is there a better way? Um, the answer is yes. There's also another reason we don't want to do that, in that if we put code like this into our classes, you're not allowed to put, uh, put that inside a package. So hierarchical references are not allowed inside packages, so classes that contain those references will also not be. So that's bad on two fronts. The normal solution is to use what's known as a virtual interface. And a virtual interface is a bit like a reference to an interface. So it's a bit, a bit like having a pointer in C, which holds the address of some object. So imagine the virtual interface is like a pointer that actually holds the address somewhere of, in the um, simulator's memory of that interface. Well, just like pointers in C, a virtual interface is a variable. So we can put a virtual interface inside our class, which is the virtual keyword in front of it. The interface itself is like a bundle of um, signals. So it's a mechanism that was introduced in System Verilog for grouping together related signals. So imagine sort of going to like a hardware example, if you've got two computer boards you want to connect together, if you've got sort of uh, maybe a hundred wires you could want, you could physically have a hundred separate wires and solder each one between the two boards. That's going to be really difficult to uh, set up and difficult to change. Um, back in the 1970s when people were faced with things like that, they invented ribbon cables and IDC connectors. So then the idea is you've got a single connector um, and a single cable, you just plug in an either end. Dead easy to change. So an interface is a bit like that. It bundles together all the signals associated with a particular connection, and an interface can be used as a port on the system verilog module. Okay, so we have an interface, we can have a virtual interface that points to that interface in C, and we can then use that inside our code. So now, um, hook is a virtual interface, so this is no longer a hierarchical um, module path. So it's okay to go into a package, and we can set the action interface that we want to point to with a constructor argument. So that gives us flexibility. So we're no, no longer locked to a particular virtual interface. So putting it together, then we've got our test harness that contains an interface. That interface is a bit like a module, so we instantiate it and we can make connections uh, with the um, pins on the device under test. And in this case, we've got wires in the interface, but we could use variables as well. So to connect things up in the test harness, we can simply add the connection between the uh, elements of the interface and the corresponding wires in the test harness. On the um, class based side, We've got our virtual keyboard hook. Okay, so that points to is going to be pointing to a particular instance of that keyboard hook, which sits inside the test harness. And we can pass that in when we create the instance of the, uh, of the actual uh, test bench. Now, this is a hierarchical path name, but it's sitting in the top level module. So that's easy to change and it's also protected. Okay, so the class based code doesn't need to know anything about the hierarchy. So it, and it can go into it and it's reusable. So the link is made in the top of the module once, so it's easy to set up and drop it in. Okay, so that, that's the approach that's normally used when we want to connect together a class based environment to the RTL code. So in terms of the structure, we've got our TV top module, we've got our test harness, and then we have this connection that is made um, here when we create the instance. Okay, so as we just said, so we've got our environment, <coughs> and then when we call new, that gets the answer and links it together. Okay, so Let's go back to the idea of randomization. 
Okay, so we've so it's easy to create random values by just adding the random keyword. The problem is that if we just have random values for random stimulus, that's generally not that helpful because completely random inputs may not test the things that you want. And if you've got some system where you uh, rely on a certain number of states um, to be set up, then it can mean that you get always invalid states and you never actually see the states that you actually input. So imagine, for example, that one of those elements was a reset, which was randomly set on every single transaction. Then there's no, there's no point in resetting every, every other transaction. So we want constraints, and the constraints are going to shape the random numbers that are actually generated. Now, constraints are also added as class members. Okay, so we can associate constraints, in this case, with a constraint wrong area. And the idea is that let's say we've got different uh, regions of memory, ROM and RAM, and we want to generate transactions where the ROM addresses, we only want to have reads, we don't want to have any writes to ROM. So we could add a constraint to try to rule that out. Constraint syntax is weird. So we've got constraints to start with open and closes. If we've got more than one constraint inside here, we need a semicolon at the end of each constraint statement, and then no semicolon after the end. Okay, so it's weird syntax, you just have to get used to it. And then that we could run that, that would then generate random numbers that meet that constraint. Now, again, this isn't the ideal way of writing that constraint because if we did that, what we find is that uh, we don't actually get any um, uh, writes at all because we've said that uh, these two must always be true. Now, that's not the way that we actually want to structure constraints. Constraints normally require an implication. So rather than saying that we want the direction to be read and the address to be less than some value, we want to qualify that and say that if the randomly chosen address is less than some value, then it needs to only be a read. Okay, so that's a different relationship. It uses implication. Okay, so, so this says that so when you call randomize, it will randomly pick a value for the address and then it will randomly pick a value for the direction. But the implication says that if the address is less than 16 hex um, 7 FFF, then the direction must be read. And the way to, best way of thinking about constraints is think about sets. So there'll be two sets of values for address, sets of values for direction, and when it randomizes, it randomly picks value for each bit in the class. But any combinations which correspond to addresses greater than 7 FFF where the direction uh, um, so less than that, where the direction is not read, will be illegal, therefore they won't get read. So effectively the constraint reduces the, uh, um, the, the number of choices that are made by the constraint, sorry, by the randomization. Okay. So that would that would give us our desired behavior so we don't get any write addresses to read write write transactions to read. Wrong addresses. Now, if we add that constraint into the bus transaction, again, that's not ideal because that's going to apply to every bus transaction. Um, that's not really reusable. So, a better approach is to use inheritance. So, with inheritance, we can have our generic bus transaction that doesn't, that maybe doesn't have any constraints. So, we'll take the constraint out of here and instead create a derived class. So the way that inheritance works in system Verilog is that we extend a base class. So the extends keyword indicates inheritance. So then that trans inherits bus trans and adds a constraint. Okay, everything else can be the same. So again, using inheritance like this is very easy. You just need to specify what's different in the derived class. And because of the way inheritance works, then, then that trans is a bus trans. So we can use this trans anywhere that a bus trans was expected. 
Okay, so that that gives us visual stability. Okay, so that's that's really important. Okay, so here's a graphical way of showing that. So if we're going to look at, for example, UML approach implementation, then we've got our bus trends, we've got data members and member functions, and we're going to use that to create a memmap trend and add an extra um, constraint. We're also adding a, a, a value here that's going to represent the memory in the region. So and what we get is something that has all of the inherited properties plus the, the new one. <clears throat> now in terms of controlling randomization, then we added a value here um, area that's never going to appear in an actual transaction. Okay, so the actual transaction, as far as the utilizing the template is concerned, knows about whether it's a read or write operation, knows about data and address. It doesn't recognize this area. So this is something that only exists in MemMap trans, which is used solely for, as part of the randomization. So it's, a, it's using constraints. So Variables like that are normally known as control nodes because they control the constraint. So what we're saying is that we've got constraints that say if the area was wrong, that corresponds to these addresses. Uh, so insights about set membership. If it's RAM, it's these addresses. If it's IO, it's those addresses. And we can have other constraints related to um, if it's wrong, which directions read, and bit setting and we can also have a disk constraint. Disk constraints allow you to control the relative probability of things happening. So that's basically we've chosen numbers here that add up to 100 just to make it easy to visualize. So we want uh, transactions going to be wrong 70% of the time, round 20% of the time and on 10 of the time. So it actually changes the weights for the different um, regions that can be selected. So that's all I'm going to say about system Verilog. So in the remainder of this section, we're going to take a very quick look at some of the features of UVM. So UVM, if you haven't come across it before, is the Universal Verification Methodology. And it supports constrained, random, published, driven verification. So that's the official term. Now it's open source, so you can freely download the source code, you can read it, you can modify it if you want to. Um, the only restrictions on the Apache 2 license is that if you redistribute it, you include the um, original copyright. Okay, so, you can, so the companies can use UVM and create their own in house extended versions of the methodology, which have uh, extra features that are required for them to work with that. It's actually an Accelera standard. So Accelera is the organization responsible for standardization of um, um, EDA. So Accelera, for example, manages um, the PHDL, um, System Verilog, uh, System C, and UVM, amongst others. And so that's where they come from. So they maintain it. But when it comes to the IEEE standards, those are the internationally recognized ones. So Accelera does the work, hands it over to the IEEE to uh, um, stand by. And then IEEE standards have a language reference manual which defines what the actual uh, language does. Okay, so 18.2 is the uh, standard. And if you do an online search, you can find um, there's a free downloadable PDF of System Dialog and UVM standards. So usually you have to pay for your IEEE standard, but Accelera paid the license fee so that you could download the UVM standard. Okay, and it was um, supported by all the major simulation vendors. In fact, the reason that UVM came about was because the simulation, simulator uh, vendors um, invested in it. It takes a lot of time and effort to create new languages and new methodologies. The tool vendors do it because they then have a mechanism that they can then use to sell their tools to the end okay, And that's more efficient than every customer having their own in-house method. 
So UVM gives you best practice, gives you consistency, uniformity, um, and avoiding common problems. So it's written by experts. Okay, so people who developed it understand, understood how to do verification. And it's written for re reusability. So originally it came about in order to support verification IP. So Accelerator wanted a standard of verification IP, verification IP, and that kick-started the UVM development. Okay, but also reusability of environments. And importantly, tests that people and know how. They may be aware that there's a huge shortage of verification engineers. There's not enough verification engineers to go around. So if you're using a common standard like UVM, it means that a company can recruit a verification engineer or a contractor for their current project who already knows how UVM works. They can start doing effective um, work on day one. They don't need to spend sort of two months learning the company's in-house network. The different versions of UVM, originally it was based on a, an earlier framework called OVM, the uh, Open Verification Methodology. Um, the most popular version in use at the moment is UVM 1.2, which has been around since 2014. There is a later version because the IEEE standardized UVM, and you can also download that. That's starting to be supported um, by all the major tools now. So the latest versions of the EJ simulators will support the IEEE version. Most companies are still using UVM 1.2 because of that. In fact, that the IEEE standard made some changes to what was there. Okay, so again, that's the current standard and the reference to the So these links will take you to a place to download UVM and to uh, download the manuscript. So mentioned UVM is based on constrained random verification. So the idea is that if we've got constrained random stimulus, we apply that to the right in the test and we get some output. So what? Well, that's not totally helpful. We need to have more guidance. So we need to have a checker that can automate checking of does that input really generate that output that goes into work. Okay, so that actually might be quite complex to do. We also need functional coverage. And if we're generating a stimulus at random, we don't know what we've tested. So functional coverage measures what is being tested. So we can see, are there any gaps? That we haven't yet tested. I mean, the idea is you want to run this invention until all the gaps are complete. Um, you could just try running it um, forever until that happens, but there may be some things which are never met. So you may need to go back and then adapt the constraints in order to focus in on those missing things. So that's the that's the most general approach you've taken today. So in terms of UVM, there's a specific way of creating a UVM architecture. So we had a UVM environment that contains components with names like a subscriber or a virtual sequencer. And the actual main building blocks are these UVM agents. Each agent is associated with a particular entity. So you may have, for example, an I2C um, agent, an AXI agent, and so on. Inside the agent, we've got standard components. So there's a sequencer, a driver, and a monitor. So the sequencer generates the stimulus. The driver translates that into a format that can be applied to the device and test. And the monitor does the inverse. It extracts transactions from the sequencer and box. There's a factory and configuration database that are used to control all of this. And the UVM test is actually going to set up this environment in a particular way for whatever it is you're trying to do. Now, there's also a requirement that you might want to do certain things at certain times within a simulation. So maybe you want, for example, uh, all of the devices to uh, have been connected before you uh, then start applying some stimulus. So there are phases associated with the different um, steps. So when the simulation starts running, the UVM starts up, there was a build phase where components get built, so our environment, followed by any child components, so drivers, agents, and components inside the agents and so on. 
Then there's a connect phase where connect ports on all of those components get connected up. There's an end of elaboration phase. So at that point, connections are all stable. So the end of elaboration can check that everything is properly connected. Some simulation is typically used for anything that needs to be done before simulation starts for real. So things like opening files are going to be written to. And then we get the run phase. The run phase is the only one that consumes time. Okay, so this is a task, all of the others are functions. And in the run phase, sequences will generate streams of transactions, and that's what drives you. You can also split the run phase up into um, a series of uh, sub phases. So the reset phase, configure phase, the main phase, and the shutdown phase. So those are all part of the run phase. So components can have these separately rather than the run phase. If you want to, for example, make sure that all the resets happen before any other main function starts up. And then the pre and the post just gives a way of um, further control of what happens at the start and end of each of those. Then there's some uh, post run phases, so extract, check, and report for uh, getting information out of the sequence and then saving it. And then the final stage, which then um, is going to finish things off. Now, I mentioned the factory. The factory is used for configuring how the environment is going to be built and what sequences are going to be generated. Okay, so we can use the factory to control which actual sequences are going to run and which components are going to get built. And so um, we could write code to generate an object of type P1, for example. And then that goes into our library. If you want to run a test that uses a different type of object, we can set up a factory override to replace T1 with a different type T2. Now, so the factory does that. The only requirement is that T2 has to be a class that is derived from T1. Okay, let's have a look at some quick examples. And if you're writing a software program, you normally start off with a hello world just to write something out to show that it's, it's doing something. So what's the minimum we can put into the UVM just to write hello world? Well, we need a, a test, an environment, um, and other one type of test. Okay, so the interface is going to be connect and device under test. So that goes in as well. We're not going to put anything in it yet. We're going to device under test. We don't need to put anything in that. So these are just going to be empty shells of like get our program up and running. And we've got a top level module that creates instances of the device under test and the interface. And then we need to create an environment. So here's our simple environment for Hello World. It inherits UVM M. So UVM contains a set of base classes that are used for each of those different types of components. Now, with um, uh, any of these components, this macro you frequently see, the so UVM component utils is um, going to register that component with a factory. And that allows it to give us the flexibility. The constructor function new for a UVM component needs to have a name and a reference to its parent component. Okay, so we always need to add those, and those just get passed to the base class constructor. So super is the base class, which in this case is UVM. Now, to do something, we're going to create a test. So we're using UVM test as the base class here. Then we have our UVM component utils macro, our standard component constructor, and the test creates the instance of the environment. And so forth, therefore we have a build phase. And in the build phase, we've got this rather ugly looking code that is going to create the instance of the environment. Now it looks ugly, but it's always going to be the same. So it's the sort of thing that you could easily just um, automate. Um, the reason for this this sort of syntax is because this makes use of the factory. So rather than just calling you yourself, by calling this create type ID create function, it allows a factory overload to be important. So if we want to change a different, create a different type of environment, we can do that by just changing the factory setting. And then there is a run phase. The run phase consumes time. Now, the way that UVM simulations work is uh, there's a it's known as an objection mechanism. 
So when you start the simulation, it will run until the final objection has been dropped. Okay, so that gives you a way of uh, managing a huge simulation with lots of different uh, modules. You don't know uh, how, how long to continue for. So any, any component can raise an objection. When the last objection gets dropped, the simulation finishes. Now, if we don't raise any objections at all, the simulation stops at the end of the first data cycle at time zero. So in our test, we're raising an objection. So that prevents the simulation from stopping immediately. Um, we're then going to wait for 10 time steps, print out our hello world message. We can then drop the objection, the simulation will stop up. Okay, so that's all the code that we need in order to run it. So we can put our code into a package, code my package, um, also including some other UVM header files and importing the UVM package. And then that's the code we're already seeing. And then to build it all, we've seen these bits already, we've now added the uh, packages and we're going to uh, have a mission block that calls run test. So the run test is how a UVM starts. And what that will do is that will create an instance of the top of the test module, so the test class, and then um, start the phase scheduler for UVM to go through the build, the connect, and so on. Okay, so, so we always need to call that, and that is always done inside an initial block at time zero. So this slide just um, gives you the complete set of code. Okay, so we've got our interface that goes in here, we've got our dot that goes in here, and our class based code is called in by certain run test. Okay, so if we run the simulation, then here we've run it on EJ Playground. So if you type in this link, that will take you to EJ Playground and load up this account. And you can pick which simulator you want to run on. So here it looks like it's running on Cadence, um, Excelium, and prints up various messages, including here our Hello World message. Okay, so that, that's getting up and started. Okay, now we haven't got much time left, so I'm going to have to um, be a bit selective about which slides I pick. But so you've got a full copy, so you can always um, repeat this. Um, for the interface, we need to add um, an interface. So in the interface, we've got some signals now. Those signals are going to be driven inside a driver. So we need to add a driver. So the, the dot's going to print out a message when it receives any data. We've got some values here inside the interface. And inside our environment, we're going to add a driver. Okay, so that has a virtual interface connect to the actual interface. And we're going to connect it up rather than passing some construct arguments in, we're going to use the configuration database. And the configuration database gives you a mechanism that allows you to pass values from the top level down to um, low level UVM dependencies. Okay, so inside the configuration database, we'll put the virtual interface, and then that can be picked up inside the driver class. So there's a set function that we can call in the top level to write it in, and then we'll call a corresponding get function inside the driver to apply it. Okay. And the configuration database is based on a hierarchical class set. So this will be our, this will be our UVM hierarchical class. So we want to pick up the virtual interface inside the, uh, not up inside this um, path, which is a wild card. So that would be that's suitable anywhere inside the UVM. The driver, we're going to use this UVM driver based class. And that's another UVM component, so we have this macro. And in the build phase, we're going to call get for the configuration database to fetch the virtual interface. So here's our virtual interface, and we're fetching it because we're giving the path name here, the name of the variable to extract, and that 
you know, I just don't think it's going Okay, so we've gone through that very quickly, but again, you can run an example and see all that happening for yourself. Um, the comp generator, um, that's just to make the ducts work. And then here in the top level, that's where we're setting up the configuration database um, and calling run tests. Don't worry too much about the configuration. So run tests, we now start that running. And what we see is that inside the driver, we've got a run phase. So UDM components can have a run phase. That's where we specify what happens during the simulation. So in the run phase of the driver, what we're now going to do is we're going to generate some random values and send them to a virtual interface. So that's then going to wake up the device under test and it will print out messages. Okay, so again, the test got something similar to before, except we're now waiting for 80. So we're not printing out a message in the test anymore. That's going to now be printed out by the device under test instead. So when we run that, again, here's an entry to the playground. Here's our output where we see that every 10 nanoseconds, the um, device in wakes up with another set of values. Okay, and um, we've got one or two minutes left, so I'll just quickly go through the last few slides. Um, sequences are really what UDM is all about. So the stimulus is actually generated by a sequence, and the sequence is a stream of transactions. So here's a transaction class that uses UDM sequence items as base class. And we've got some variables here that we want to randomize. Um, use a slightly different macro to register the factory because uh, sequences are not part of the component hierarchy. So that's why we use a different macro. And inside the create sequence, we've got a UDM sequence class. So this is the type of my transaction in the previous slide that that uses. And inside the sequence, we have a body task. The body task is going to get um, run when the sequence is started. And it's going to go around eight times. And then what UVM do does, UVM do is going to create an object rec of my transaction. It will randomize it, and then it will send it to the driver. Okay. So, um, in terms of the environment, we've got a sequence and we want to have a sequence cell. So, the sequence cell is a component that the sequence runs on. Okay. So, don't mix those two up. So, with the um, sequence, we're now getting sequence items from a sequence of four chains. So the sequence, sequence is going to get what we call UVM do, it will generate sequence items we pick up inside the driver. And then this slide just shows the connections for them in the environment. Okay, if we're a sequence, we have to start the sequence, we can do that in the test. So we're creating an instance of the sequence, and then setting the starting phase, that will then automatically allow objections to be dropped at the end of the sequence. Okay, and then finally start, starts the sequence running, and that kicks off the, uh, the sequence. So then that happens inside the run phase for the test, and the run phase for the test is started by when we call the, uh, when we call the uh, run test function in the top. Okay, um, let's say if you want to uh, simplify creating UVM. A lot of the code is just boilerplate code. It's always the same. And Easy UVM is a project that we created a few years ago to create a code generator and a set of rules to make it easier to get up and running with UVM. So the code generator is about 5,000 lines of type of curl. Um, we do have sort of a, um, plans to at some point in the future replace it with Python, but that's a huge amount of effort. We haven't got time to do that at the moment. Um, companies have used it and have found it helps them to get up and running quickly. It's also quite useful if you just want to create some examples of UVM code to play with, because you can automatically generate 
some working examples without having to worry about writing all the code yourself. Okay, so again, that's available on the GeoLoss website. Um, so just to summarize, so we're a training company. Uh, this lists our areas. If you want to know more, then come and see us um, on the stand. Uh, as I say, come and see us anyway to get your golden reference guides. And keep an eye out for regular webinars. Uh, so we have lots of webinars in the area of UVM and system level. There's one coming up on the 15th, I think, on, um, uh, on using UVM. And again, that, that's going to be at a more relaxing pace, which will actually give you a chance to perhaps um, explore the ideas in a bit more detail. So this was, a, this was intended to be just a, a real sort of um, glass, a bit like drink, drinking water from a fire hose. It sort of probably overwhelms you, and, but at least if you have a better picture, hopefully, about what UVM is, than we did an hour ago. Okay, and that's the end of our presentation.